James chapter 4, and we'll continue our study in the book of James. <clears throat> it's good to see everybody here. It's good to see Miss Jackie here this morning, and <clears throat> uh, good to have everybody together. We've been kind of sick and puny along the way, and we kind of, last week we had a little bit of abbreviated service, and didn't feel right, did it? I'm glad we got to get back together, get back into our regular scheme of things. <clears throat> Always include God in your plans. <clears throat> this is a, a lesson that James teaches us, and it's a, a very important lesson for sure. Not that any of them, the others are any less or more important, but this is another important lesson that James, a practical lesson that James teaches us. <clears throat> And we'll go ahead and let's see if I've got, uh, let's get our scripture here. And James, we read that and then we'll come back and make some comments about it. <clears throat> go to now ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that you ought to say, or for or what you ought to say, you might want to read it that way, what you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Have you ever thought about the possibility of your death before morning? We don't we really don't want to think about that, do we? We don't think about the fact that it's very possible, very it could be highly likely that we might be dead before morning. And just go to sleep, go home, go to bed, like you always do, and the next thing you know, you're in eternity. James says our life is a vapor, right? It's a vapor, and it appears for just a little while, then it vanishes away. I think he's trying to emphasize to us there the brevity of life and how frail we are and how quick we can be taken out of here. And <clears throat> kids don't think about it, right? Oh, you're too young. But I'm going to tell you right now, death knows no age. It just does not. Knows no color, no creed, no age. Death is, uh, we're, we're all facing that and we could be facing it before we leave this building. A lot of the times we see men who waited to take care of spiritual things and they waited too late to take care of their spiritual matters. You know, they're too busy. We're too busy to take care of things like that, right? Just too busy. I mean, we got all this going on. We got a lot of things going on in our life and we're just so busy and spiritual matters get shoved down the line, and we don't take care of those things. It's too busy. But you, what you have that person's life would be summed up is too little, too late. And he finds himself in eternity unprepared. That's a bad way to be, bad place to be in your life. And James is bringing this to our attention here. Now you just think about this, and you think about the way we live and the way we go and how we push ourselves and the way we live. It's just the way it is, isn't it? We, we, we work and we, we get and we, we try to get all we can and we work to have this and that and it just grows and it, just, just, it, evolves, it starts evolving into something bigger and bigger and bigger and before you know it, you're so busy that church don't have a place in your life. God don't have a place in your life. And he's talking to these very brethren here about this. These are Christians that have somehow or another got caught up in the turmoil of worldly things and earthly things and all this buy and sell and get gain and, and, and planning ahead and they're forgetting God. So James, in our previous lessons, has been talking about this idea of lust. Remember we talked about that and how that affects our thinking and, uh, and how it leads us into different stages of worldliness. And now he rebukes the same spirit 
in those who have uh, wandered through life and pursuing gain or seeking gain, and I want you to underscore this in your mind, unmindful of God. That's the problem, right? Now, having jobs and, having, and, and, and going after uh, material things in life is not necessarily wrong, okay? That's not what we're saying here. But James is driving to the point here of the fact that you have done this to the exclusion of God. There's where the problem lays. And I'm going to tell you something. You say, I won't do that. But you might be guilty of that. We might all be guilty of that from time to time. And I've witnessed this throughout my Christian life and in the church and, and how that works. You know, you have a great job, you want a better job. And you'll take a better job to the detriment of you coming to worship. You say, well, it's a better job and I get twice a pay, but every other Sunday I have to miss worship. You know, well, you know, I have to make that, I have to make that decision for my family. Well, you've made the wrong decision. If you've made, if you take a make a decision in in the pursuit of material things to the exclusion of anything that pertains to God, you've made a bad mistake. You've sinned. And James is pointing this out to the, this 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 these brethren here as he writes to them. So this is what we're talking about: unmindful of God. You don't, you've left God out of the equation. The brevity of life should be a test of our faith every minute that we live. Remind us to consider God when we think about our, our brief life on this earth. You should consider God. And that's why God is emphasizing these things in his word. And as a result of that, you know, if we, if we keep in mind God, and we keep that perspective right in our lives as we go throughout our lives and pursue the things that we pursue and do the things that we do, go the places we go. And we keep that in mind that we're, our life's going to be short and I want to consider God in everything I do, then I'm going to tell you what we'll be ready for. We'll be ready for death. When death comes, we'll be ready for it. And, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, you should not dread death. If you're a Christian, you've been baptized into Christ, you're living faithful, doing the best we can to live for God, you should not dread death, ever. In fact, we should maybe even look kind of forward to it, right? Because, listen, we get on the other side with God in paradise. Remember we talked about that paradise place that we go get to rest? If we're righteous, we go to paradise and we wait a judgment. It's going to be the most beautiful, peaceful thing that we'll ever get to enjoy. You can get that here on earth. You can get part of it. We get a, we get a taste of it, right? As we consider God and we, we're baptized into Christ and we're part of the church, we get a good taste of that pleasure and peace. But you don't get the full result of that until you get on the other side of eternity. So we want to be ready, don't we? And so we don't want to dread death. We want to think about death in a good, positive way. For it can come at any time. Don't forget that. Any time we can, we can leave this earth. Now, let's think about some of these verses. James 4.13. Go to now. Ye that say today or tomorrow we will get in, go into such a city and continue there a year, buy and sell and get gain. What's he talking about? Well, he's rebuking the human planning that leaves God out. Now, a man, when you think about leaving God out, if you leave God out, let's go back, let me get this quote in here. I haven't got my quote in here yet. This is an old Jew, okay? And he was, a, he was really, he wrote some of the best material that you can ever read about Christ and the child and, and the history of Christ. Erdesheim. And notice what he says here. And I want you to get this now. Care not for the morrow, for you know not what a day may bring forth. Perhaps he may not be alive on the morrow. And so cared for or was anxious for, that's what he's talking about. He was anxious for, he worried over, got all worked up over, so he, and so cared for a world that does not exist for him. Are you getting that? So if you get all worked up over these world, 
earthly things and you, and you get so worked up over it that you forget God and you die in that situation, you're going to be in an eternity and you're, the things that you were so worked up over, you don't, you're not even going to want anymore. I mean, you don't need them on the spiritual side of things, are you? In eternity. You're not going to need those things. We're not going to need these material things. And I've often brought this to everybody's attention when we talk about this verse. Marriage and divorce and remarriage. And when you, you, you ignore God's laws about what it means to be married properly. And you go out and you live in adultery. And you, you die in that situation. Listen, you're going to be in eternity. Living in eternity in eternal hell for something that you don't even desire anymore. You, think, you see where we're going there? We care not for tomorrow, right? So he's talking about men that leave God out of their plans when they go pursue these things. So let's look. You know what actually a man that says that, that you know, if, he, if you exclude God from your plans, you're basically saying that you don't really believe that there's a God. And what does the Bible say about that in Psalm 14, 1? A fool has said in his heart there's no God. So we off the bat, we get this idea that if you begin to pursue worldly things, earthly things, and you ex God out of your life, you are a fool. I didn't say that. God said that. A fool said in his heart there's no God. And, he's, and right here, James is bringing it to these men's attention that they're doing things to the exclusion of God. So it don't work out too well, does it? This verse, verse number 13, covers a problem that's age old. This is not something new. This has been around since, one writer said, since the, the, the creation of man. But you have to go a little far, a little in history before you really get a good picture of what, what he, James is talking about. And we have an example of that in Genesis chapter 13. You remember in Genesis chapter 13, you have the story of Abraham and Lot. And we talked about that some a few weeks ago in one of our lessons. I can't remember if it was in class or one of the sermons. But Abraham and Lot were very rich and they had a lot of cattle. And so there's this, this fighting amongst the herdsmen about their cattle and where they was going to, where they was going to you know, graze their cattle. And Abraham brings it to Lot's attention and says, look, we shouldn't be fighting like this. We're brethren. There's no need to be fighting like this. You know, you take which land you want and I'll take which land I want. And you say, well, that's a good thing to do, right? And so we have this idea of Lot and the Bible says that he, he looked and he saw the fertile ground toward Sodom, right? And the Bible says he picked that land because it was well watered and it had all this fertile uh, grass and beautiful uh, grazing property. He said, that's what I want. And Abraham, you can have it. And I'm going to go this way. And because of that, of course, God blessed Abraham. Even he was blessed with more land. But go back to Lot. And the Bible says that he pitched his tent toward Sodom. And you say, well, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? It has a lot to do with what we're talking about. You see, he was pursuing things in a material way. And he was inching further and further away from God. And where does Lot wind up? Well, he, line, he winds up in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's living there. When God visits Sodom and Gomorrah and lets the people there know that it's going to be destroyed because of their uh, ungodly ways. I'm going to destroy it. And he warns Lot to get him out of there. And so there's another principle there, by the way. Now, we know that Lot made some blunders there. And yeah, I'm going to tell you something. Him pitching his tent toward Sodom led him into Sodom and... Uh, you say, well, was you know he was living amongst all this stuff in a city that was just gone to the gone to pot, so to speak, and here he is in the middle of that. And you say, well, he was the, he was must have been an idiot. No, he was just a person. He was just a man, right? And he made a bad decision, right? And maybe more than one decision he made bad. But he did make some bad decisions. And you say, well, we'll just ax him off and throw him into hell. We're done with him, right? Is that what the Bible says? Well, I find in the scripture that that's not what the Bible says. And I didn't put it down, but in uh, 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8, I might have put it in there. Let's see if I did. Uh, I did not. So it's 2 Peter 2, uh, 7 
through 8. The Bible, Peter calls him two things there. Righteous and just. You say, well, wait a minute now. You're talking about a man that was living in Sodom and Gomorrah and he basically, how did it end for, how did it end for Lot? Do you know the end of the Lot story? Well, he basically had to leave his son in the laws in Sodom. He got his daughters out, but his son, his, their daughters, his daughter's husband wouldn't come. And his wife, came out with them and basically she didn't do what God said and she wound up, he, he lost his wife in the process. You think it turned out good for Lot? It didn't turn out good for Lot. Well, why? Because he was pursuing things for the wrong reasons. And you say, well, he's in hell. No. The Bible says he was a just and righteous man. Here's a man that was living like God would have him to live. He made a mistake. Can we not get that? And the Bible says he was just and he was righteous. And, and you say, well, what happened to him then? Well, you see grace, don't you? You see God's grace here. Grace in the Old Testament. The Bible says he was just and he was righteous. But he made some mistakes and God was gracious to him. He got him out of Sodom, didn't he? And he would have saved the rest of them if they'd have come. And so <clears throat> there's a lesson in that. Not only that we, listen, we... We make mistakes, don't we? All the time. We in 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 our pursuit of things, we make we may make blunders, and we say, "Man, boy, that was a bad mistake." Well, what are we going to do about it? Well, I, here's Lot. He fixed it, didn't he? He was righteous. He was just. He fixed those things. Somewhere along the line, Lot repented. He says he vexed his righteous soul day to day while he lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. He found himself in that situation, and God got him out of it. So that's just a, a really a side note, right, about a lot. But that's my point is these kind of pursuits are age old. God warned the nation of Israel, the whole nation, right, as they were coming, as, you're, as we're memorizing our books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you find that story of God's people being put into captivity, brought out of captivity, and God says, I'm going to bring you out of this land of captivity and I'm going to give you a, a place of, of beautiful land, the land of Canaan, promised land. And he says, I'm going to have, it's going to be yours. It's my gift to you. You've got to go in and take this land. So it's my gift. And he warns this nation of the same, very same problems that James is talking about in James 4. Now, they were warned by God through Moses about how to deal with their newfound prosperity when they crossed over the Jordan. Let's look at some scriptures here. Deuteronomy 6, verses 10 through 12. Listen to these words. It shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fieldest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not, and thou shalt have eaten and be full. Now notice in the red. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. You get that? So what was going on? Well, they got to pursuing things, right? They, they go into this land of promise and they found this prosperity, this peace, this, this calm. And it would be so easy for them to, for, been to for, forget God and say, well, this is mine. And notice on there. Let's read some more. In Deuteronomy 8, same book, another chapter. We have in Deuteronomy 8, 10 through 20. Listen to this. When thou hast eaten and art full... Then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord God thy God in, in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I commanded thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when the herds and the flocks and multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought 
there were, and there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of the flint. Now watch it. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do the good at the latter end. And thou say in thy heart, look at this, my power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. There it is. What's happened? They have forgotten God. They go into this place and get all caught up in pursuing these material things and they totally leave God out of the picture. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that hath given thee power to get the wealth, and he that he may establish his covenant with he, which he swore unto thy fathers, as it is this day, and it shall be if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. And that's to me is just, you don't, that is a commentary, to exact commentary to what we're looking at in James 4 here in verse 13. And he's given you some example after example of people who were warned about that. Well, here's a quote from a pulpit commentary. I love this quote because it really is true what he says here. This is, of course, of a man. But listen to what he says about this verse. <coughs> no amount of outward prosperity can deliver a man from himself. What about that? You know, we think we can, we can have wealth and get gain and get all this stuff and we are better for it. But that's not the case, is it, most of the time? By the time the state of calm was attained, and he's talking about the children of Israel here, which is here indicated there would cease to be danger from hostile foes, at least for a while, but there would be perils of another kind which would attend them even in the promised land. If Israel could have left himself behind, it had been otherwise. But alas, go where they might. They must perforce take themselves with them. And all their liability to err, and all the proneness to sin, and all the temptation to doubt or to pride, and not all the spears and slings of warriors could put the people in such peril as the corruption of their own hearts. And so it is with us now, and ever, and now and ever. Listen, it don't change. And so <clears throat> James is warning us about how we pursue things and how we better keep God in the mix if you want to be successful. And God will see to it that you are successful. You're already experiencing that. And you're learning that, you know, I put God first. David told me the other day, he said, when all this stuff got put in my business, I prayed to God, if it, if it be your will, God, let this happen. Boy, what an attitude. And some of my brethren hadn't learned that, been in church 50 years. And here's a man that's already learning these things. And you got, that's great. But I'm going to tell you something. The devil can make you forget that real quick. He can take that right out of your mind and say, well, I really don't, you know, I thought that I needed God, but I, I'm going to get this and I'm going to do that and I've got this and I can have this and we, here we go. So here's a warning to a whole nation, right? So you say, well, you know, surely they, it worked out for them for a while. You know, about 40 years. 40 years. All it took them, then they just left God. And there's Judges 3 that says so. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and, and forget the Lord their God and serve Balaam in the grove. So it's about 40 years or so, maybe not hardly 40 years of history that we find the children of Israel forgetting God. And because of the material things they were blessed with in them pursuing. So you have that there for history. Now what we're talking about? Well, we're talking about this age-old problem. So it's, we have it in the Bible, right? The Jews of Jesus' day uh, were making the same mistakes. 
And we find this recorded for us in Luke chapter 12. And you might make a note in your notepad and go home and after you think about it, you might want to put it in your Bible. But it's amazing to me that you find our Lord as He would teach, oftentimes as He would teach a lesson to people. And here He was talking about some very important spiritual things about blasphemy, about how you ought to follow God. And, and somebody comes along and says, Hey, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, excuse me, uh, would you... Uh, Help me get my inheritance divided with this guy. He won't give me my inheritance. Would you help me with that? Uh, right in the midst of what Jesus was talking about, these, these deep spiritual matters. Here some guy comes along and says, uh, uh, Excuse me, Lord. Uh, I got a money troubles, and uh, I'd like for you to help me with those. Would you do that, please? This is exactly what was going on here in this context. If you read chapter 12 of Luke, go home and read it. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful, and he, he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruit? And he said, Remember now what the context is. This guy's asking him about his inheritance, his money. Okay? This will I do. I will, put, I will pull down my barns. I will build greater. And there will, be, there will I bestow my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, and by the way, thou there supplied is in italics, so it's not there. God said, fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Now what we just got through talking about here? James 4, 13. That's exactly what James is talking about. Thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be? Which thou hast provided. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Now, I helped us a little bit with this, okay? I want you to see this. You see what I emphasized? I, myself, himself, my, me. Oh, look at that. What's he hung up on? The very thing that James is talking about here. You say today you're going to go into such and such a city and you're going to buy and you're going to sell and you're going to have and I'm going to get. Well, what's the problem? Well, there ain't no God in those eyes, are they? There ain't no God in me and myself there, right? And he says, your soul is going to be, you are a fool. And your soul, you're going to die tonight. He says, you're going to die tonight, you fool. And what are you going to do with all this stuff? Whose is it? Well, you're going to leave it to somebody that's going to probably blow it in or do something with it dumb. And you just don't know, do you? And so there you go. I remember Brother Wayne's talking about he was a funeral director and he'd talk about people at funerals. And he said, I could sit and watch. He said, and they would go in and they'd read the wills of these people. And he said, I could tell you by the expression of their face what happened. And one come out and be a crying, he didn't get a thing. One come out and be a grinning, he got a lot. And he said, that's exactly what happens to your stuff. He said, they'll just paw over it and it'll be, it won't mean a thing to you. Remember what we said? Waking up in eternity. And you fought all your life with these things and you've shoved God out of the way and you forgot God and now you're in a place that you don't need these things or don't want them. So we get that, don't we? It seems these brethren that James was writing to were experiencing the same trouble, right? Same trouble of those back in Lot's day. Same trouble of Israel, the nation of Israel. Same trouble with Jesus in his day. And they were going making another cycle here doing the same thing again, making the same mistakes. No doubt the lesson for us is the same Today, we can be and often are guilty of the same things. You've got to be careful. So James warns us, if we say we're going to do this or that, what we've got to do? If a man of faith will say, if the Lord, it is it's the Lord's will, I will do such and such. That's the way we've got to look at things. I'm going to put one more little point in here before we move to the last one. Not only is the gain seeker guilty of this, but the pleasure seeker can be just as guilty. Okay? Now, we get all caught up in pleasures, right? In things that it gives us joy to go do. And that could be a host of things, right? In this world. Pleasure seekers is no less guilty than the money seeker. They both wake up too late. And they both find themselves, their, their life defined as vanity. You know, you know some scripture for that? Look here. 
in, in Ecclesiastes, one of those hard ones there, Denise, one of those hard ones to say, Ecclesiastes, this is Solomon, okay? The wisest man we have record of on the earth. And he says, I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. What's he talking about? Pleasure seeking. Going out and, fi and finding things that all oh, bring so much pleasure to us, right? And it could be whatever. It could be hunting. It could be fishing. It could be sports. It could be whatever that we are so caught up. I know a guy, and he's, he's a deacon in the Baptist church, and all he talks about constantly is ball. That's all he lives, eats, and breathes, ball. Whatever kind of ball, it's, it, they go from one to the next. And that's all they think about. Well, what is that? That's pleasure seeking. And they're putting God to the exclusion of that, right? Now, Solomon, the wisest man on earth, he says, I, I pursued that. And what he say was, I perceived that this also is a vexation of the spirit. It didn't end well for Solomon in that pursuit, did it? And in Galatians 6, verse 7, 8, the Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, he shall also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap everlasting life. You see that? So we want to sow to the Spirit first and then God will take care of those material things and he's always promised that and we got to get that in our heads we got to get that lesson as God's people then we don't want to be guilty of those kind of things and so point number two what is your life only God has a lease on your life you got to remember that only God has that lease we are vapors and that appear for a short time all of nature you ever think about this? All of nature teaches the brevity of life. I got up this morning and I looked outside and it was a little frost, you know, kind of frosty on the grass. And it wasn't just a few minutes that the sun popped out and guess what? That frost was gone. It's like it. You ever get up in the morning and be real foggy and the sun pop out and it won't be just a few seconds that fall is gone. Well, this is what James is saying about life and the brevity of life. You know, the it, it's the life is short term. We've got to get that. It's short term. And uh, I had a slide there. I didn't use it, but I had a slide. I asked the question. If, uh, if you were to ask a 90-year-old man what he thought of the brevity of life, what do you think he'd say? He said, well, 90-year-old, he'd probably say it's long. But I guarantee you, you ask any 90-year-old on this earth, and they'll tell you how short life is. I can tell you from a perspective of an old 63-year-old man that it's short. I mean, I don't feel like I've been on this earth 10 minutes, and I'm 63, okay? So nature, it teaches us the short term of life, brevity of life, the morning dew, the grass of the fields, the lilies of the valley. All those things teach us this very thing, right? And we have a scripture for that. 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Look, look at it. For all flesh, that's me and you, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower thereof falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. See, the spiritual and the physical. And Peter there paints a picture of a short and brief stay on this earth. Through what? The earthly things, right? The, the, the very things that we're talking about, the... Nature of nature. No one can lay hold on tomorrow. Well, that's what James says, right? What is your life? Nobody has uh, dibs on tomorrow. Look at Proverbs 27 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We just don't know, do it. It's foolish then to plan and live constantly in the future. 
Boy, we do that, don't we? We put ourselves in the future all the time. Well, tomorrow I'm going to do this. Tomorrow I'm going to do that. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to do that. We live in the future all the time. But all we have is today, right? Today is today to obey the gospel. You know, that's a good way to segue into this idea. Today is the day that you need to obey the gospel. You may not have tomorrow. You may be killed before you get home today. You may die of a heart attack. I don't know. But look at that. He, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, Paul says, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. But what do we do? We let the devil convince us that we got tomorrow. And James says that's bad juju, right? In John 9, 4, 5, and verses 4 and 5, uh, it's time to take care of all that needs doing. I must, Jesus said, you know, when he was on the earth, he knew you had a short time, didn't he? He knew about that. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it's day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So there's our cue. We want to be busy, right? Doing things for God and, and, and keeping God in the forefront. That's the point. Today is the day to start building for eternity. I love this scripture. It's one of my favorites. And that takes us back to our Sermon on the Mount. Remember, there's that connection there, right? With our text. This is the ending of the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' conclusion of that sermon, that beautiful sermon on the Mount. Look at it. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. Well, why, Lord? It was founded on a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, he shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Listen, if we lose our souls over material things, it's going to be a great fall, a great loss. It's time to start building for eternity. And Jesus gives us a little insight to that. Knowing this, we should do our tasks today, right? We should make friends today. We should seek the lost today. We should make our home happy today. We should look for good today. And don't leave God out of our plans for tomorrow. That's the message, right? One more point. For that you ought to say, verse 15, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Now, this, this term, this phrase, if the Lord will, this, this should be a governing principle in our lives, if the Lord wills. And I think that we may we make it some kind of overworked phrase. And I, you know, we just throw it out there, everything, you know, I'm, all right, I'm gonna go mow the yard if the Lord wills. Well, I'm gonna wash my car if the Lord wills. You know, I'm gonna go fishing if the Lord wills. No, what, what's the point here? It's, it's, a, it's a principle that God wants you to have in your brain that I know that God will is first. If the Lord wills, I'm going to do this or that. And Proverbs 3, here's a great passage that helps us with that. Listen to this passage in Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord. There it is, right? It's about trusting God, believing in God, having confidence in God. Do we have that confidence? Do we have that trust in God to say, well, if the Lord wills, I'm going to let this happen. I'm going to do this if it's God's will. And then we put it in God's hands. But what happens is we do that, and if it don't happen, we're all sold up mad for a year. Well, that's not what I wanted. Well, you put it in God's hands, and you didn't, it, it didn't happen, so that was a blessing, right? Look at it. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. That goes right back to what we're talking about in James 3, all these passages we've looked at. Lean not to thine own understanding and all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. 
It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. I love that passage of Scripture. And that's exactly what James is trying to get across to these people, his brethren, that they ought to have this principle in their lives. When you look at Paul's life and you think about Paul, you study Paul, you know, that was one of his principal uh, ways, wasn't it? If, you know, if the Lord wills, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And, you know, we read, and he meant that, didn't he? You know, and sometimes it wouldn't be the Lord's will, and he wouldn't get to go. He said, well, if it be the Lord's will, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And God said, well, no, you're not going to Jerusalem. He said, well, I'll go somewhere else then. And we see that principle over and over in first, uh, uh, John, uh, Acts 18, 21, and 1 Corinthians, and Hebrews, and, and all through the Bible, we have this spattered out. If the Lord wills, if it be the Lord's will, I will do this or that, or I'll go here or there or yonder. And Paul had that concept under control, didn't he? He understood what James is talking about here. So we're talking about God's, what are we talking about? God's providential care. God's providence. God watches over us. God cares for us. God sees to our needs. And we should remember that all of our lives. And so here's a conclusion. One simply cannot be a Christian and leave God out of their life. You just can't do it. You can't leave God out of your plans. Don't ever be guilty of that, any of us, of leaving God out of any plan we have. God must be in uh, every part and particle of our lives. He is the center focus of our lives because He alone, listen, controls every event that happens in our lives on this earth. And His will must be our will. Otherwise, the spirit of pride and arrogance will defeat us and we find that in the study of the Old Testament with God's own nation and how they forgot God within a mere 40 years. Pride and arrogance. Well, why? They left God out. Now, here it is. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And that's our lesson for this morning. And I hope it's been one that's going to be helpful to us. And, and especially as we pursue things in our lives and, and in the world that we have to live in. As long as we keep God in the right place, Listen, we don't have any worry, none whatsoever, about what we do uh, as we pursue things in this world, if we let God be at the forefront. If you're subject to the invitation, you can come while we sing.